always ready to kneel. Welcome to today's Muskogee City Council meeting, February 25th, 2019. Uh, we'll have an invocation and then follow that with a flag salute. So please join us. Father, thank you for today and thank you for the love that you show to us as a community. Uh, it's hard for us to express back the, for the gratitude that you show to our community for the leadership and guidance that you show in our community. We lift up the family of uh, Judge Mike Norman today who passed away earlier today and just ask that you would be with him and comfort them in this time of loss and grief and be with our community. Uh, he was a significant part of our community for years and years and uh, <coughs> such a kind-hearted person. And Father, thanks for the example of leadership that he gave us as a community. Be with us tonight as we meet and consider this business of the city. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Please join us for the flag salute. Attention. Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Roll call, please. Mayor Bob Coburn. Here. Deputy Mayor Janie Boydston. Here. Dan Hall. Here. Marlon Coleman. Jamie Stout. Here. Wayne Johnson. Here. Patrick Kale. Here. Ivory Van. Here. Derek Reed. Here. Entertain, entertain a motion regarding Mr. Uh, Coleman this evening. Make a motion he, we be, he be excused. Second. 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 Got a motion and a second. Any comments? Roll call. Deputy Mayor Jenny Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Motion carries. We'll now consider our minutes from the regular session of February the 11th of 2019. Is there addition or corrections to those minutes? Move for approval. Second. Uh, got a motion and a second. Any comments? <coughs> Roll call. Deputy Mayor Janie Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Mayor Carpenter. Yes. Motion carries. The consent agenda is items <coughs> 1 through 16. Is there anything on there that anyone would like to move to regular agenda? Make a motion we approve consent agenda item 1 through 16. Second that. A motion and a second. Any comments or discussions regarding the consent agenda? Roll call. Deputy Mayor Janie Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Uh, motion carries. Item 17, please. Consider approval of ordinance number 4066A, an ordinance pertaining to finance and taxation, creating section 74-302 through 74-310, article 14, chapter 74, Muskogee Code of Ordinance by enacting a new ordinance assessing and levying an excise tax of 33 one hundredths of 1% in addition to all other excise taxes assessed and levied by the City of Muskogee, Oklahoma and all other taxing authorities upon the gross proceeds or gross receipts derived from all sales to any person taxable under the Oklahoma Sales Tax Code codified in Title 68 Oklahoma Statute Section 1350 providing for the administration and collection of said tax, providing for the use of state permits in lieu uh, permits issued by the city, stating the purpose of the revenues derived from said sales tax and providing for the disposition of proceeds therefrom, declaring that revenues be used for the financing of street maintenance and rehabilitation projects for the city, providing that the tax shall be limited to a period commencing October 1, 2019 through September 30, 2025, making the tax cumulative, providing that the governing body may make administrative and technical changes that do not affect the tax rate or time limitations, requiring approval of this ordinance by majority of the registered qualified voters of the city voting on an election held for such purpose on May 14, 2019, as provided by law, providing for codification, providing for an effective date, and requiring the full text be published or take other necessary action. Tammy, you get a gold star for reading that. Mr. Miller. Yes, I may or may not take as long as uh, Ms. Tracy did. She did very well. 
Uh, we have talked some about uh, these uh, next two items, and I want to uh, just briefly update it. As we do have a sales tax that's expiring later on this year, and the council has directed staff to put together a proposal to renew that tax and possibly repurpose that money. So um, on this question, uh, here's the sales tax that's expiring we had for sewer and capital projects. Um, uh, we know that uh, the 2014 CIP was a good investment in our community. We can see that at King Center and numerous other projects all around town. And so as we look to the, the new projects, uh, this question deals with the 0.33% uh, uh, for streets, uh, the majority of the proposed uh, tax to renew the expiring tax. Um, so what that looks like um, is about $12 million, $11.8 million for streets. Um, I think this is probably a good time to point out that um, our, uh, the areas that we look to improve um, and that we've declared in the purpose are maintaining and improving residential streets. We think that's going to be about 100 miles of residential streets over those six years. We also have a match from the City of Muskogee Foundation. So if we indeed do collect um, this nearly $12 million in streets, the uh, street tax, the City of Muskogee Foundation will match that with an additional $12 million. They've already voted to do that. So this would really take our street budget from about $2 million a year to about $6 million a year, um, would allow us to not only maintain what we have, but to improve what we have to a great degree. Um, these would be used again on residential streets, collector streets and residential areas, replacement of, tra uh, of traffic signals. Um, and with that, um, I, would, uh, I would pause and, and uh, say that we do recommend approval of this tax and, and having that on the uh, upcoming special election if the council so desires. All right. Do we have question or comment regarding this item? Well, this is what our city asked for. They wanted better streets and we're giving them opportunity to vote on it and take care of it and get us some better streets in this town. I if think it's a great thing. We just need to get after it. 50 years, 50 years of, and, and more, but of seriously underfunded streets in this community and if this goes through uh, it, it, it's folks are going to be very 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 pleased you know one of our citizens that'll be pleased is Mike Stewart Mike has uh, fought for this for years and this would be culmination of that and I know it'd be a, a happy day for him if this indeed passes <laughs> Other question or comment? I move for approval. Second. Got a motion and a second. Is there a question or comment regarding the motion? Roll call. Deputy Mayor Janie Boydston? Yes. Patrick Kale? Yes. Wayne Johnson? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Derek Reed? Yes. Dan Hall? Definitely. Jamie Stout? Yes. <clears throat> Mayor Coburn? Yes. Motion carries. Item number 18. Consider approval of ordinance number 4067A, an ordinance pertaining to finance and taxation, creating section 74-311 through 74-319, article 15, chapter 74, Muskogee Code of Ordinance, by enacting a new ordinance assessing and levying an excise tax of 17 one hundredths of 1%, in addition to all other excise taxes assessed and levied by the city of Muskogee, Oklahoma, and all other taxing authorities upon the gross proceeds or gross receipts derived from all sales to any person taxable under the Oklahoma Sales Tax Code codified in Title 68 Oklahoma Statute, Section 1350, providing for the administration and collection of said tax, providing for the use of state permits in lieu of permits issued by the city, stating the purpose of the revenues derived from said sales tax and providing for the disposition of proceeds therefrom. Declaring that revenues be used for the financing of certain capital improvement projects for the city, providing that the tax shall be limited to a period commencing October 1, 2019 through September 30, 2025, making the tax cumulative, providing that the governing body may make administrative and technical changes that do not affect the tax rate or time limitation, requiring approval of this ordinance by majority of the registered qualified voters of the city voting on an election held for such purpose as provided by law, providing for codification, providing for an effective date, and requiring the full text be published or take other necessary action. Mr. Miller again. Yes, yeah, so. You get a second gold star. 
so this is uh, the second half of the assignment the, that the city council gave and, and the input that they've given is hopefully reflected here. Um, the, the second question uh, on the proposed ballot is for the remainder of that half cent. It would generate approximately $6 million. I think this is important um, to point out uh, that we, uh, in our city ordinances, um, adopting these taxes in the past and, and as proposed today, these are not budgets. We don't know how much money is coming in. We've used numbers and rough estimates moving uh, to get to this point, so we think we can do the projects within this amount. But we're not able to necessarily predict the future six years out. Um, and so uh, the dollar amounts that we've heard have all been kind of general guidelines to set expectations, but there's no, um, there's no commitments uh, in the ordinance proposed and there hasn't been in the past. Um, so as we go through, the, uh, here's the, the projects that we've got included um, in the um, second question. Uh, they add up to a total of $6 million, so all the, the money would be used for these purposes. Um, the, there are a couple of things that I'd like to, uh, to point out. I do propose um, a couple of minor changes from the uh, ordinance that was sent in your packet, uh, and I'll explain those why. Mr. Garvin has those, uh, I believe, to hand out. Yes and there's some available for the citizens. There's two things, um, two minor changes. One would be on uh, the, uh, what appears as number, uh, number nine on your background, or I think letter I in the ordinance um, to change and make the uh, body camera replacements for police, uh, to change that to um, I mean, I can a more specific term, allowing them to use it for technology improvements and body cameras. So a minor change, but it makes, uh, makes sense for the, the projects that they have, they have in mind. Um, secondly is that we've got a, um, a project listed for facility improvements to aging city facilities. Included in that list is the Roxy, but um, there's been some discussion uh, and that uh, there's been some indication it might be better to single that out and make it its own project. Either way, it's in the CIP. So uh, the new one proposes the Roxy Theater project as its own project within the CIP, uh, rather than being lumped in with other facility improvements, um, much like the King Center and some of the other facilities have their own project listed. Um, with that, I understand there are um, some citizens who've signed up to speak on this, and so uh, I'd be happy to turn that over uh, to, to them at this time. I think that's appropriate time. While they're starting that, I just want to say, Count, uh, John Tyler Hammonds, uh, want to say, I uh, appreciate the council's continued investment in streets. When I sat where you all sat uh, a decade ago, oh, my address is 3401 Canterbury. I'm not used to it. Uh, where I sat where you all sat a year ago, or 10 years ago, the city spent uh, half a million dollars on streets. With, if this passes, it'll go to four million. So I applaud the council for your wise investment. I appear before you today in my capacity as the attorney for Oxford Management. They are the management uh, body for the Roxy Community Theater Trust, which manages the Roxy. If you all recall, a couple, of year, uh, a couple months ago, you all set this up. We are asking that the Roxy be not only included in the CIP, but designated as a uh, principal beneficiary of that uh, program. A little background. The Roxy was renovated in the early 2000s. I think uh, Mayor McBride was the mayor at the time and that occurred. That renovation only covered the ground floor. It made some major improvements, really revived that building. So it's uh, still owned by the city, so this is a public purpose. As part of the Roxy Theater Community Trust mission that you all charged them with, they are considering ways to make the Roxy more usable, more a, a more attractive venue, and the thing that's constantly come up is to continue the work that was started in 2000. The second floor uh, of the Roxy was, uh, was never renovated. It's still very much uh, outdated, uh, older materials that need to be replaced. We need to bring up to, to code. Uh, for example, the structure currently does not meet the, the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, so those citizens are unfairly excluded from certain benefits for this facility. The various trustees at the meetings have talked about a need to improve the facility and, a, and in finishing out the renovations was project number one. Here's a list. I'm not going to read everything on there to you, but 
the building's got some needs, has HVAC problems. It needs an elevator for it to be ADA compliant. Uh, we need to improve the uh, dressing rooms. We've got two, other people here that will speak to the, those needs, but I'll let them speak to those particularly. But this facility is a wonderful facility that's unique to the city of Muskogee. There aren't many Roxy theaters left, but to finish out the work the voters started by a CIP back in the early 2000s, these are things we need. We need an expanded lobby, we need expanded dressing rooms, we need improved HVAC and the like. We feel that these things are necessary to make this, make this facility the best facility it possibly can. Like every time the community is polled, they want more investment in downtown. That's what we're asking for you all to do today. Complete that mission and make the Roxy an even better downtown venue. We've seen a lot of improvement in the last couple of years with this facility's use, and we need to take that one step <coughs> further to get where we want to be. We'll let the testimonials speak for themselves here in just a minute. As I talked about, one of the, the reason we want to do this isn't just so we can have a pretty building that no one uses. As we have our tenants come and that rent the facility, <coughs> these are the things they're constantly identifying to us. We need a better uh, uh, technology. We need a better st staging room. We, need, we just need better stuff. Y'all may recall that the Roxy is the home of the Oklahoma uh, Movie Hall of Fame. Whenever they do the induction ceremony, it's done in a tent in the parking lot. Uh, we are asking guests to come from all over the state. We want to make that a better place for them. We have a hard time attracting weddings and the like because there is no place to have a reception. We'd like to have more dance recitals, but there's really not a place for for those people to get changed. If you have more than just a few people in the dressing room, the dressing room is quickly run out and they then have to start changing in the alley behind the facility. Uh, that's not the kind of image we want for downtown. We want to ensure that this becomes a place that people want to come. So here's the ask. We have our estimates wrought up. We believe the estimates will be somewhere between two and three million dollars to do the total package. Make it ADA compliant, improve the HVAC, and do the various other amenities. What we're asking for is the opportunity to get there. We're asking that the city match that. So we're asking for between one and $1.5 million out of the CIP and then let us raise the rest, either from federal grants, private donors, and the like. We want a chance to double your money by showing that people, this community, and the federal government and other, in, other key stakeholders are interested in seeing the Roxy be a more vibrant part of Muskogee's downtown. <clears throat> As I talked about, the CIP and various grant funding, how we propose to fund this. Again, we are asking for the opportunity to earn more money for this community. People enjoy the Roxy, they enjoy downtown. Let's make the citizens happy and say, we are a continued invest in downtown. It's not just Shawnee Bypass, it's not just the other areas. We're committed to ensuring that the core of Muskogee remains a part of our economic development efforts. Happy to answer your questions as I notice I have eight seconds left. <laughs> Very timely. And I'll let my... Now, do you... Yeah, I was going to say, are you going to call up the two other I'd, people? I'd let, they, they've each signed up, so they both get their two minutes. They have. They are people... Or five minutes, I apologize. They'll get their five minutes. They'll exp they are users of the facility, and they'll explain that. I've, yeah. I've got a question or two for Mr. Hammonds first, if we could. Yes, sir. Uh, how did you uh, perform your estimate? We... Uh, there is no money in the budget to uh, have a formal estimate done. We based it on a uh, square footage of the facility, uh, other comps for elevators and the like. So that's how we came to it. We uh, have had a, an architect kind of give us a rough estimate, but of course he hasn't been paid. So if we had a, if we could pay him, we'd have a much clearer estimate. But based upon his voluntary help, that's how partially we came to that number. Did, did, uh, do you recollect the square footage number? Off the top of my head, I don't, Councilman. I'd be happy to get you that information. Uh, my next question is. So the Roxy will raise funds, and then we'll match those funds. Out of the CIP, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mayor, I mean, I'm sorry, I almost called you Mayor Hammonds. <laughs> well, that's proper. Probably Mayor Hammonds. That's proper. Um, With no disrespect to current Mayor Coburn, of course. <laughs> okay. Is it not ADA compliant downstairs right now? I believe, it, as it is down right now, I, I believe the first floor is, but I'd have to check on that, but I believe it is. I know certainly the second floor is not. Okay. Right. And then you were talking about uh, expanding the lobby. Is that going to interfere with the current design of the building? How is that going to affect the historical value of the building? I know they did a remodel. 
So I'm sitting here thinking, <clears throat> okay, we got a historic Roxy, but is it going to be a historic Roxy when you're done with it, with all the elevators and the new upstairs and everything else? How close to the original Roxy is it going to stay? We're going to keep it historically accurate. Make, that, that is our goal. What makes this build, that makes this facility so unique for Muskogee is you know, there's no other comparable venue compared to this. The, the beautiful neon. So and we have not done an architectural rendering, as I've explained to Councilman Kale. There's not been money in the budget for that. But we would, it is our desire that no matter what happens, it maintains that historic feel. It maintains that authentic feel because that's what draws this facility. That's the value of this facility. No one wants to just, you know, go to just a regular movie theater and do a thing. It's a Roxy, it's historic, that's our goal. We want to keep it authentic. Mm -hmm. So to get clarification off, off of Mr. Hall's question, would it go in the parking lot area? That, that as we have proposed, certainly we're open to whatever we can make happen. But I th as proposed, it would expand to the, I guess that would be the west in that parking lot. That's okay. a city-owned parking lot, so you wouldn't have to acquire land there. Well, in my mind, that helps with keeping, I think your question is losing the integrity of the facade and the whole feel up front, so expanding out to the side answers my question. Yeah. And that's kind of where I was heading because <laughs> if you start messing with the front of it, I'm trying to figure out how you were going to expand the lobby out front when it's always been ever since I was a kid, I mean, Mayor Colbert can go back further than I can, but I'm sure <laughs> that, it is, uh, that it's always been kind of tight when you go in like that, so I wasn't sure. Was it like yeah. that, Mayor Colbert? <laughs> yes, it's always been tight. <laughs> to answer your question. Back when you were buying nickel bags of popcorn. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> and you could stay all day for the nickel bag of popcorn and a quarter to go to the show or whatever it was. But. Well, Councilman, uh, to show you where I am, it's always been renovated from my memory. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, we know. <laughs> Let me just pitch in, and I'm not, I don't want to take up a whole lot of our time. I had a chance last uh, weekend on, a, on Friday night a week ago to be in the Coleman Theater in Miami. Uh, which is a thousand seat auditorium. It's a little different configuration than what we have, but there is a part of the building that was added new uh, onto that to, to provide other opportunity and it maintained then and, and uh, uh, Patrick, it maintained that integrity on the outside, but there were some things that they did to increase size inside uh, and, and I'm, I'm excited to report back to our board whenever we meet next time kind of on that trip and, and operational costs and uh, things they've been able to accomplish and connections they've made with Branson shows during their off season and things they've done to increase activity um, in the Coleman theater and and to uh, and are working toward getting it to a sustainable self-sustainable uh, operation so yeah it can be done. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of money. And, and, and Mayor, we appreciate those comments. Certainly, as you identified, it does take money, it takes a vision. Oxford Management and the uh, Trustees Board has a vision for this. Uh, if we repair the, if we renovate the second floor, we could easily double the number of people that can uh, enjoy the facility if we just put down traditional seats. That's not the plan. We want to do something special with the second floor, maybe do like box seating, something just to create a little different venue that doesn't exist in Muskogee. A little, just something a little different that we don't <coughs> already have uh, that's not just the traditional seats as you would see at the bottom. The, bon the seats at the bottom are historic. They are original to the facility. I think they've been reupholstered, but they are uh, original to the facility. That second floor, we're looking to do something different. Um, Patrick, I think it's 2,000 square feet is what we discussed in the, our, that last board meeting with the trust. Well, 2,000 square feet for your addition. I was looking for a cost per square, square foot, foot to build. Overall. I don't remember which one. I don't remember the specifics of I know Mike of, was, honestly. what Mike was, I don't remember. What yeah, I don't the, remember a number. I know he read, kind of gave a rough estimate. Yeah, well, well, 150 $200 a square foot. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, but, I yeah, just was but, curious. Yeah. A significant portion of that, uh, Counselor, is the installation of an elevator. Yeah. For to, to make the upstairs um, to utilize for the, the ADA. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions before I turn it over? <laughs> Thank you all for your consideration. If we can have Mr. Ron Ray. Thank you. 
Sharon Ray, 735 Terrace. I think that's where I live. <laughs> uh, okay, just to set the record straight, the Roxy and I are the same age, born the same year, the Roxy, so. So it was built in the early 70s. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> uh, run the Bare Bones International Film and Music Festival, and many times I am asked by filmmakers about having special red carpet events, but they always ask, could we do this or do that a little more? You know, I'm not going to be able to rent a tent for special events so that usually doesn't happen just during the festival so people are able to have their movie premiere at the film festival um, I don't think it's quite ADA compliant when it comes to getting up and down the stairs uh, we've been making do with the pipe to get up the stairs I've had the blind struggle to get up there I've had to help people out of wheelchairs try to alter what we're going to do because it is dangerous going up the steps. And if you have on evening gowns, it's even worse. Men, I know you don't have to worry about high heels and things like that, <laughs> but I'm so afraid that sometimes someone is going to trip just because there is no way to balance. You need banisters that would be something that a person could hold on to. Um, the Roxy attracts filmmakers from around the world. First thing they say is, my film going to show at the Roxy. When it's not at the Roxy, they think I don't like them. And I try to explain, they all won't fit at the Roxy. At one time, we had access to the upstairs, and we had a second screening room in the upstairs where is now the Oxford offices. Uh, the fire department eliminated us having anything up there because someone could not come up those stairs. So that shows that we could, which people loved it, uh, we had a whole different venue going, and that's without using the extra seating that's up there. That was just in the front. We know that over the years, even the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame have had inductions up there, decorated, made it real pretty. We've all strived to make it pretty. We've had receptions up there. We were in the tent last year uh, due to the generous donation of one of our filmmakers. That won't be available this year, so we have to find other places to hold the venue, have uh, receptions, place to gather. I'm uh, glad that you went to Coleman, Mayor Bob. Um, I've been trying to get everyone to go check out the Circle Cinema. Uh, we were familiar with that over 12 years ago when it was nothing but a pigeon roof. <laughs> now there are three big screens and an awesome awesome lobby uh, art shows in addition to gatherings uh, film gatherings filmmakers love to gather that's one of the things they love to do besides show their films uh, the Roxy is very historic not only um, you know historically but in case you don't know we've been featured on a ghost hunter show yeah the ghost of the Roxy have you seen it no, you probably haven't. I'm going to find it. I never saw it, but Oscar was there with them when they talk, <clears throat> discuss with the ghost. I have many people who have told me who they thought the ghost were, but that's a whole other story. We need renovations. It is a tourist destination. It could be a better tourist destination. We have the iconic marquee, the neon. We had filmmakers here from the home of another Roxy that's in Missoula, Montana. And if you go online and you put in historic or renovated Roxy's, because theirs have been renovated, and yes, what they did is they kept that front hit correct mm -hmm. and they added and improved. And I'm going to be sharing that with some of the people. I just found that one today. We've been looking for different Roxy's. Um, Oh, gosh. The Movie Hall of Fame is just getting its legs. This is the third year this year, and from there, we really want it to grow, and we want people from Oklahoma to know that it resides at the Roxy in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and we want to be proud of our facility. We want the, we, we want the building to be in good shape. We want things to be repair. We made a lot of progress, but we know we can do better. Because after all, we are Okies from Muskogee, and we're proud of it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for me? 
I've been there since 2002 with the festival. We had our first uh, festival there. I think it renovated in about 2001, opened, and we've been there ever since. How many do we get in for the Bare Bones Festival each year? Uh, we get an average of 300 filmmakers um, in showing their films over a six-day period. Um, attendees vary from year to year. It could be as low as 500, could be as high as 1,000 coming. But since they all won't fit at the Roxy, we have several other venues which disturbs people. If we had more space at the Roxy, it would give a better experience. We are lacking, say, in comparison maybe to another festival that have three screening venues in the same spot. We even considered the Arrowhead Mall after the theater uh, was removed, but uh, the theater, the Epic, took the chairs. Uh, that sort of sucks. We didn't mind about the projection because we could have done that, but the chairs, that means a diff additional expense. So we're, just, we're looking at alternatives. If you have them all in one, one area mm -hmm. and have that gathering space and the venues, that's pretty cool. Yep. So the Roxy could be that space. It does a great job on bringing tourism into Muskogee. From around the world. Yes. And they're coming back in April, last week in April. Awesome. Mark, everybody mark your calendars. <laughs> yeah, speaking of, can you, this would be a good time for you to tell us the dates for this year's festival. April 23rd through the 29th. Excellent, thank you. And the 29th is a Monday, but we have two museums open on the Monday, and we have filmmakers staying to go to either Five Tribes or the Batfish on Monday. So festival's not over till the last filmmaker leaves. Awesome. Other questions or comments for uh, Mrs. Ray? Well, keep up the good efforts. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cockle, we have you next to speak. <clears throat> if you would give us your name and your address, please. Hi, my name is Bob Cockle, and I reside at 2309 Callahan Street in Muskogee. <coughs> and I'm his wife. Yes. Isabel Cockle. Yeah. Been here a long time. Yeah, it's we've here. had a dancing school 47 years here. Okay. And we love the Roxy. Step as close to the microphone okay, as you can. I sure will. Okay, will. Right. And we've had uh, our productions there uh, as of lately, last four or five years, but it's always a problem with the dressing rooms. We have a cast of 40 or more senior citizens. I'm the oldest. <laughs> and uh, we get together, we rehearse at our house, and then we do our production at the Roxy. And our problem always, again, is the dressing room area. We, uh, this year we were lucky to have the uh, Habitat for Humanities. They have a storefront there on Broadway we use their facilities for our dressing room as one of them. And so that's where it stands right now. We are going to have our show uh, May the 4th and uh, the 5th, yeah. And anyway, it would really be nice to have a dressing room there. They also need to expand the backstage area, which there really is none. And if you use the parking lot as part of the backstage area, you know, expanding on that, that would definitely be a plus in the theater. Uh, we have capacity audience. It seats about 300. And uh, we have a lot of senior people here in Muskogee that are coming back year after year to see our productions. <coughs> and, of course, I know most of you know the people in the cast right now. Uh, but that's our pitch for it, is to, to get dressing rooms there and actually expand the back, uh, backstage area. And as far as historical value, as a kid, I came over here from, from Oak Mulgee, and I saw, uh, I guess, one of the first movies that was shown there, a uh, John Wayne movie. <laughs> but I really, uh, I'd love to see the, the Roxy expand, and especially for us older people, to make it more accessible for us to do our production there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Cockle, do you have other comments? <laughs> uh, <Yes>. well, <laughs> Pull the microphone down if you would. Yeah. Toward you. There you okay, go. Okay, I'm a little thank shorty. You. Getting shorter as I get older. Uh, but um, anyway, I, I also would see a lot of possibilities at the Roxy. We would have our dance recitals there if there was additional uh, dressing area and holding area for kids. 
we were one of three dancing schools here in Muskogee that would use that facility. Muskogee High School is okay. It's very expensive to, to rent, and it's very big. It's all, you don't even really fill it up. At least not dancing schools don't completely fill it up. And um, this is, and more people have told me, we've done several shows over there at the Roxy. They have told me how they like the historical feel, look, and the intimacy. You are closer to the stage, you can hear everything. And, uh, and I like that too. It's very warm, it's very cozy. Um, and I, another possibility I was thinking of, you could have weddings if you refurbished the second floor and made it a reception area. As far as the other parking, what we've done with parking, I know that uh, Dr. Robinson has the parking lot just east of the theater, and all I have to do is call him up and can we use it? No problem, I'm not gonna tow any cars. I just get permission and we don't have a problem. Um, but anyway, yes, historically, um, Roxy is very important to Muskogee and everybody loves it. We would like to see it improved on. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Are there questions or comments for the cockles? No, I'd like to make one last comment. Uh, you might pass this on, Mr. Hammonds. It might be helpful if uh, you're able to, to head this direction uh, to maybe have a subcommittee of some local, maybe some are retired, maybe some aren't, contractors that when you've got committees of folks that know nothing about construction, uh, and I, by no means am I saying to cheap anything up or whatever, but it's been my experience that if some of these committees that are building out venues or what have, have a little bit of experienced people kind of behind the scenes to say, oh my gosh, so, you know, you, we can get an elevator for 20 percent less or we can do this or whatever. If maybe you have a subcommittee of some retired contractors or contractors that are really fervent about seeing the Roxy get, yes, sir. Uh, you know, you might say 15 or 20 percent on the project just with a little bit of help and guidance. Just a thought. I appreciate that insight. I'd be happy to take it back to Oxford. Mayor, do we have anybody else signed up to speak? We do not. That's everybody that had uh, asked to speak. So uh, I'm a I'm an advocate, and it's more to the council. I'm an advocate of the of the Roxy. I, I really do. I go to um, uh, one bare bones uh, film festival is you know kind of the highlight of my year. I usually take off vacation and go. Um, uh, it's it's one of the things I go to a, non, a number of the movies. I think it is something very unique to Muskogee. We, we are blessed with a lot of things that are unique to Muskogee. Um, but I am concerned when we're looking at spending one-sixth of the CIP or trying to use one-sixth of the CIP for one facility. Um, we have Three Rivers. We have the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame. We have the Batfish, which is probably you know the number one tourist attraction for our community. Um, you know, one of the things that the council has discussed is one million dollars for all the facilities that's, that's in our community and, and we've neglected our facilities in our community just like we have neglected our roads and it's not us on the council here i'm speaking but over the years we've neglected our facilities and we have got to start doing something for our facilities um i i, I would hate to hate to try to invest over the next six years one sixth of it just on one facility um, I want to see the vision that they have, and I thank you so much for having the vision that you have for the Roxy. I want that too, but I can't see the neglecting of our other facilities at that risk. Um, you know, that would be my concern. That, that would really be my concern at trying to take away from any of our other ones that we've taken a look at, because we've looked at all those projects and said, where could we do these things? Um, you know, that would be my concern right now. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you took the words out of my mouth. Uh, I was going to speak up and say the same thing. We kind of honed in on various projects and the costs of those and the need of those. So before I could support this outright, I'd like a little bit of interaction from staff 
And what I like best about this proposed project is matching funds. But maybe uh, because we've got to stay true to our designs and plans on these other projects, you know, maybe we can match 40%, maybe we can match 30%, you know, uh, towards the total project. But, but I do think we've made these other commitments, and I'd like to look and see where we are and, and where we might be able to, you know, how close we could come to their request of, you know, matching one to one. Uh, and I'd just like a little sure. guidance from staff and, and to see where we are because I don't want to drop or neglect another one of these projects that are in, it, they're all in dire need, the things that we've addressed. Let's give Mr. Miller an opportunity to speak to that. Okay. Comment. Yeah, so um, the, uh, your question is, is kind of what kind of guidelines have we set out? And as we, we talked about in last week's uh, committee meeting, we had a million dollars set aside for facilities, and then that would be prioritized through the budgeting process what those are. Um, the Roxy was enumerated as one of those facilities that should. So I, I want to make sure everybody that's here knows the Roxy's been included in the CIP all along. It's really the question that really uh, that appears to be before us is to what extent. And so um, the, uh, with the existing plan, we could use the, the estimated budget of a million dollars for facilities. We could use that all on one, uh, and we wouldn't have to change the, the uh, existing um, CIP program of work really at all um, but that's really a policy decision that that you guys are in the the unenviable you know task of having to make and so um, the uh, one of the things that we look at are there are a lot of opportunities for us to fund capital um, capital projects we do that in our uh, capital budget each year that's always tight um, we have a matching grant fund that we had it this year in our general fund budget um, that, that can be utilized for people who get grants. Um, and the Roxy's availed itself of that already uh, this year, and we hope that they continue to do so. Um, this year we had a, um, through our, our budgeting policy uh, that you all put in place as the council, we had um, money um, to appropriate mid-year through a budget amendment. Again, that's according to council priorities. Um, so the... Uh, what I, what I think is that with the plan that we have in place through the CIP, um, we can uh, put significant amount of money towards the Roxy, and we don't have a budget commitment, again, on any project in the ordinance that's before you. Um, what, I've, what I think, to address your question, Mr. Kale, is um, what I've seen in the community, having lived here in Muskogee for nearly 20 years now, is that if the Roxy were to go uh, and get a grant for one and a half million dollars and it would need a match of a one and a half million dollars to get it done, uh, that I have confidence that between the city and the City of Muskogee Foundation and private citizens that I think we would make that happen over time. And so um, whether we do that um, through the CIP and do it uh, up front or whether we um, commit money through the CIP, uh, which we already have, and then just uh, the discussion really to me is um, the uh, what kind of ex expectations do we want people to have? Um, and so we've we've had discussions for a long time, based off the input that you've given me, and that's how we came to the point that we're at. If we need to change those expectations, that's certainly possible to do. But if so, that this is the time, and this is part of why we wanted to do our discussion now, um, because we have the opportunity to to make changes if the council so desires. Well, so what we're voting on today, potentially, would would be anything within uh, Section Four, uh, A One, A through N, that all of those projects will be included in in some capacity. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely correct. We're not saying we're committing X number of dollars to any one project. That's correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. But my, a minute ago, you said it. it you well, that's what we voted on last week. Like, yeah. Okay. All right. So we're on the same page. Then. So, so we're. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The way I understand it tonight is, out of all of those projects uh, that were available to those funds, we're going to designate the Roxy 
as to having the majority of those funds? No. Okay. No. No. We're just we're no. voting for everything A through N. Yes. And so, on this list. so what I so the amended list was to make sure that it was clear to the to the public that the Roxy is its own project, and uh, so we added that as its own project. Okay. That's the only uh, that's the word amendment. There's not there wasn't dollar there there haven't been dollar amounts associated at Fantastic. any point through the ordinance. So. Um, and, and I needed to clarify the, the police technology one as well, so we've made those changes that are before you. Okay, so, so we were all aware that the Roxy was part of this project. We're just pointing that out. Okay. Exactly. But that's a question. Yeah, Thank so you. That, that, that's the changes, so it's easier for the public to see that the Roxy is uh, a priority within the CIP. To your Fantastic. comment regarding But the people. only dollar amount that was divulged out there was a million dollars was set aside really for facility maintenance. Right. And that's, again, uh, what I was talking about earlier is, is managing expectations. We don't know how much money is going to come in. It's all an estimate. Yep. We don't know what certain projects are going to come in when we bid them out. So um, the ordinance doesn't commit us to spending X dollar here, X right. dollar here. It commits us to getting these projects done as best we can with the yeah, resources and, that are available. And we're all fans of being in the position to match funds. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why we established this year in our general fund budget a matching grant fund. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification, when guys. When Mike Martin came to the uh, Roxy Trust meeting, he, he came with generalizations and not specifics. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And so I think the, the trust needs to have more meetings and kind of flesh out kind of what that looks like in terms of identifying what the project would be. The, these were all just thrown out as terms of ADA compliancy and adding an elevator and so forth, and it, they were just guesstimations. They certainly were not mm -hmm. architects' uh, right. estimates or engineering estimates, either one. So, right. Jamie, yep. did you have you, a comment as well? Nope, you've got it. I think that, you know, whatever we can invest in the Roxy as we move forward to help increase the dressing rooms and different the different needs that will benefit us and keep our – historic value downtown well, well I'm understanding what yep. we're doing now and yep. and uh, thanks for the clarification and I'll state again anytime a project has matching funds I won't oh, take yeah. a close look <laughs> at it anytime for sure yep. okay item 18 is there other discussion regarding item 18 I think we should mention that um, when we talk about all these things we should urge our citizens to shop at home because the more you shop at home, the more money we're going to have to put on whatever you want us to spend it on. Yep. <laughs> well, and, and, and I know we had discussion about having weddings and other different events. We have a number of private uh, venues here in town that have made quite an investment to, to cater to those events. Um, and, and yet, the Roxy does some very specific events, and I would really like us to, to head down that avenue. I mean, bare bones, the movies, the dances. I, I would like us to, to hit that direction, but we have a number of venues that, that our community has made tremendous investments for weddings and those venues that I don't know that the city would want to be in necessarily competition with them. And I would just like to throw that out as a city councilman. But, but there's certainly endless possibilities with what that the Roxy correct. could do. Oh, that is correct. Move for approval. Second. Oh. A motion and a second. Well, one yes. Um, Go ahead, Mr. Tucker. Uh, <clears throat> we just need clarification on the motion and the second, whether that is going to be the presented ordinance or the one that is in the packet. I think uh, Mr. One Miller's request amended. is that the uh, uh, presented ordinance, the revised one, is the one that is adopted. And so I want to make sure that your motion Mm -hmm. is for that as well as the second so uh, my motion is for the one that was revised that was okay. just handed out okay so for clarity and for voting purposes what you're uh, voting on tonight is to approve uh, the uh, ordinance 4067 a uh, as presented showing the modifications to section four thank you i'll re-second that so we're good on motion good on second yes and is there other discussion regarding the motion? No, and then this the, is in regards to police and Roxy. Yes, th those two changes are on the, the, the change. And, and just to be clear, that what this does is it gives us the leeway to be fully supportive uh, of the Roxy and shows that in the, um, specifically as a project within the uh, 
ordinance, which I'm, I'm happy to do. Okay, we've got a motion in a second. Is there other comments? Roll call. Deputy Mayor Jenny Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Motion carries. I'm 19. Consider approval of resolution <coughs> number 2747, a resolution authorizing the calling and holding of an election in the city of Muskogee, state of Oklahoma, for the purpose of the adoption or rejection of ordinance number 4066A of the city relating to a 33 one hundredths of 1% 1 sales tax of the city and defining the purposes for such tax, including specified city purposes, and for the purpose of the adoption or rejection of ordinance number 4067A of the city relating to a 17 one hundredths of 1% 1 sales tax of the city and defining the purposes for such sales tax, including specified city purposes, or take other necessary action. Mr. Tucker. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, uh, what I am passing out for you, and Mr. Garvin, if you would help me, please. Uh, distribute those to, those mem to the members of the audience. Um, you all now. We've all got some. Um, you all now have uh, passed both of the ordinances. What this uh, resolution does is call for the election and also set the ballot language uh, for that election to be held on uh, May 14th. So uh, what you have before you today is that ordinance along with the proposed questions as uh, specified by the ordinance. Uh, ordinance number 4066 relating to a 0.33 uh, percent sales tax will be proposition number one. Uh, the 17 one hundredths of one percent or 0.17 percent, it will be proposition number two. Uh, this resolution also articulates the date of the election, as I said, on May 14th, uh, for it to be held in accordance with excuse me, to be held by the county in accordance with uh, state election law as well as our own city code. Um, on the uh, last page, you will see where the uh, polling places uh, have been articulated. Uh, we did have a change on one of the polling places by the uh, uh, county election board, and so that has been modified. Um, as is required by state law, we must uh, submit this resolution calling for the election 60 days prior. Uh, and so if you all approve this tonight and uh, once it's executed, we'll get it over to uh, uh, Kelly Beach in order to uh, get this uh, on their radar. Uh, there is a requirement that the resolution be published in its entirety, uh, 10 days, but not more than 15 days prior to the election. And so the clerk's office will handle that. Uh, one final thing that I did want to articulate is uh, a section on the top of page seven. Uh, the polling places, as I articulated, uh, that are identified here are subject to a change, uh, subject to change by the Muskogee County Election Board. Sometimes the inspectors and watchers, um, or excuse me, the inspectors, clerks, or judges change. Uh, last year, last CIP, we had uh, one die, so we needed to have the freedom to allow the County Election Board to appoint those individuals. So uh, that list is current as of today. Uh, however, in 60 days when the election happens, uh, we can't predict uh, that all those folks will be available. So um, this uh, proposed resolution gives the authority to the uh, election board to make that modification. Other than that, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I recommend approval. Questions or comments? Move for approval. approval. Second. Uh, Got a motion in a second. <laughs> and again, that uh, the uh, distributed uh, resolution incorporates the changes in the ordinance that uh, uh, Mr. Johnson and uh, had proposed that we adopt and Mr. Hall seconded. So uh, what I'm asking is for that motion to include the uh, new resolution 2747 that was presented in council. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Question or comment? Roll call. Deputy Mayor Jenny Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Mayor <coughs> Coburn. Yes. <coughs> Motion carries. Item number 20. Consider approval of authorizing the mayor to sign a proposal and all required documents from Francis Solar of Tulsa, Oklahoma to submit a grant application K1819-109 to the Department of Environmental Quality for electric vehicle charging stations on the city's behalf on or before March 1, 2019 or take other necessary action. Ms. Blunkett. 
Mr. Mayor, members of the council, the city manager had approached me a couple weeks ago in regards to an opportunity for um, a possible grant for electrical electric charging stations um, for citizen use. Um, there were a couple stipulations to this grant. Um, it had to be submitted by March the 1st. Um, it had to be either on an individual set or on the Highway 69 corridor. And if it was on the Highway 69 corridor, it had to be within one mile of Highway 69. Um, he asked that a committee um, be comprised of myself, um, Prague Mahajan, Drew Saffel, and Chris Cummings, and all thanks to them for making this um, project possible. Um, when we started to pursue the opportunities for this, we, came, um, we ran into some obstacles in regards to location. Um, our first thought was Hatbox, um, great location with the um, RV park there to put electric charging stations. However, it wasn't close to um, real, any restroom facilities or um, public attractions that was, um, the grant was looking for. So then we found a location that we own um, next to the Quick Trip on Highway 69. Um, it is one of our lift stations. Um, when we started to um, do research into the electric charging stations, um, we came across uh, Francis Solar, um, and they are partnering with many cities in Oklahoma to um, pursue grants on behalf of the city. Um, we're asking tonight for approval for Francis Solar to um, apply for this grant on behalf of the city. Um, if the city had pursued this grant initially, it would have been an 80-20 match. Um, the city would have been responsible for 100% of the costs up front because it was a reimbursable grant. So we would have been responsible for $330,000 approximately, um, and then about $105,000 at the end. Um, when Francis Solar approached us, they said that they would take care of everything for us, all infrastructure costs, all um, equipment costs, everything. Um, and actually, they would pay the city $250 a year to lease the property. Um, I have David Jankowski with Francis Solar here to do a presentation for you and a answer any questions if you might have any. Um, thank you very much um, to uh, City Council. First of all, for putting this on your agenda so quickly. Uh, we approached the city oh, about a week ago uh, and that we're in front of you right now. Um, just very, very grateful for that opportunity. Um, I just want to talk just a very few uh, minutes just about myself and, and my company. Uh, so I come from a fourth generation Oklahoman family. Uh, my grandfather, uh, Julian Rothbaum, uh, he was born in a log cabin in Hartshorn, Oklahoma. Uh, my dad grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, my mom in Oklahoma City. Uh, so my roots in Oklahoma uh, go quite deep here, especially in, in the southeast part of the state. Uh, so I did not grow up in Oklahoma, but I moved back here about four years ago to start a renewable energy company. Uh, so we're based in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, we're really renewable energy developers, uh, and we're technology agnostic. Um, but we, we do solar, we do wind, we do battery storage. Um, really anything that, that touches renewable energy, we do. So uh, one of the technologies that we started uh, looking at about two years ago was electric vehicle infrastructure. Uh, specifically, you know, electric vehicle charging uh, for uh, cars when they're not at home. So this is public infrastructure um, for electric vehicles. Uh, so this is a, uh, Francis obviously is, is my company. Um, just want to talk a few minutes about EV vehicles in general, and then I'll talk specifically about what we're trying to do here um, in Muskogee. So um, this is obviously what mobility uh, used to look like, um, a couple of gas dispensers in the middle of nowhere. Um, they might, <laughs> they might uh, <coughs> work or they might not. This is now the future of mobility, and this is electric vehicles. So instead of gas dispensers dispensing gas, what's going to happen in the future and the future is actually here. But you're gonna have dispensers look like gas dispensers, but they're gonna be dispensing electricity. Why do we think um, electric vehicles are coming? In part, one, because of the amount of investment that is going into electric vehicles in general, not the infrastructure, but the actual vehicles. So Volkswagen, um, I th I'm sure most of the council is familiar with the diesel emissions cheating kind of global issue um, where Volkswagen was deemed to have cheated on their diesel emissions as a result of a court settlement 
um, they were required to fund billions and billions of dollars into clean technology in the United States, um, and that includes electric vehicle infrastructure, of which Oklahoma was awarded $3.1 million. So the state, through the Oklahoma Department um, of Environmental Quality, ODEQ, is administering the application of these funds. These, uh, the RFP for these funds is due on March 1st. So we have been going around the state talking to many municipalities um, and, and effectively saying this, we would like to put your city into our grant application. We are going to come into your city and install this infrastructure regardless of whether we receive these funds from the Volkswagen settlement. This will only enable us if the project is awarded to do more in the town. So how are we able uh, to do this? Well, let me talk first about the corridors. Um, so Muskogee is right on the green line corridor. That's a tier one corridor, meaning the RFP is going to give more weight to a project that is on that corridor. Uh, so that's obviously um, the most important kind of part of the uh, Volkswagen settlement. The other part is in the matching requirements. So for any applicant applying, they will have to show uh, proof of funds for 100% of the costs, and then 80% will get refunded by the state through this fund if awarded. We are going to municipalities and, and private owners, et cetera, and saying, okay, regardless of this grant, we can come in and put in a system that we will own, operate, maintain, including all of the electrical infrastructure that is required to run uh, these dispensers. They're quite uh, huge energy hogs, which is one of the reasons why the utilities love this infrastructure, because it's gonna encourage people to buy electric vehicles in the future, and they're gonna go home and charge their cars at night. Um, so utilities love this because it creates demand at night when it's low demand <coughs> electricity times. Um, so uh, the utilities um, um, are on, uh, on board with all of this. So we're bringing all that infrastructure, which is quite expensive, to the, um, to the, uh, the dispenser. It's going to be separately metered, so we pay for all of the energy costs. So a host, in this case the city, will never see an electricity bill. Um, they, they really won't even know it's there. Um, we are going to hold these assets for 20 years, which is why we're asking for effectively a, a, a lease ultimately or an easement of some sort um, or even a, 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 a services agreement. However, it can be kind of couched and that's um, for, for legal, obviously. Um, but we just need the ability to be on that site for 20 years. The reason why we need such a long um, uh, time frame is because the, these vehicles are, uh, these charging systems are just not going to make money for, we're forecasting, at least three to five years. Um, and, that's why, and that's simply because there's not enough electric vehicles in the state of Oklahoma yet. Um, we are taking a risk that electric vehicles are coming to the state of Oklahoma, that adoption is going to increase, and that more people are going to use uh, these charging systems as time goes on. Um, but it's a risk, obviously, as a, as a private kind of enterprise we are willing to take. It's not so much a risk, I think, that uh, municipalities or, frankly, some of the smaller utilities are willing to take. Um, so we're coming in and, and saying we'll do all of this. Um, effectively for free um, for uh, the municipalities. Not only that, um, the reason why we, we really want to work with the municipalities as opposed to private um, landowners who we also are working with, um, and in fact in the city of Muskogee we've been talking to multiple site owners um, that would like to host chargers as well. Um, and the reason they want to host chargers is because they realize that it is going to drive um, drivers of electric vehicles to their place of business. Um, that's really a reason for a site host to have it. For a municipality, um, what, what we really want to do is not only put electric vehicle charging stations kind of on the outskirts of town um, where the larger travel spots are, we want to put one right downtown. 
and the reason for that is that's going to draw traffic to local you know local restaurants bars you know downtown just downtown retail and so that's usually typically kind of city you know city owned sites and that's why we've kind of focused on the site today because we really see that as driving traffic downtown the other thing by putting it on city sites is we can offer government employees as an example we can offer them discounted charging rates we really want to encourage people to adopt EV in terms of marketing Chamber of Commerce city of Muskogee logo whatever you want we can really brand it a city of Muskogee electric vehicle charger so that's probably I know the clock isn't even going but I don't want to overrun my time I just wanted to point out because you're probably wondering how we're able to do all this there is a Oklahoma state tax credit that expires at the end of 2019 and interestingly it's been on the books for about 30 years and no one's really even kind of discovered it and it was also probably too early to the market for electric vehicles but the tax credit allows for a significant tax credit not only for CNG fleets but also for electrical fleets it expires at the end of 2019 we have raised quite a bit of money to go and install this infrastructure all across the state of Oklahoma we're focusing on the tier one corridors for now but we're gonna branch out into non corridors sites and we're able to do that using private capital that's leveraging the tax equity financing so wanted to make that clear how we're doing this I think yeah that's that's about all just in terms of electric vehicles what we're really excited about and why we're taking kind of this view is in 2020 the Ford F-150 is coming out with an all-electric pickup we think that's going to really kind of flip the switch in Oklahoma we're excited about that but I will open it up to I'll open it up to questions how many of these charging stations are going to be at this site that if we give you this so it would depend on um, if, if that project is awarded funding we will certainly put in at minimum what they call a 50 kW uh, system that is a, a fast charging system that can charge a car anywhere between 40 minutes to two hours and that all depends on the car whether the car can receive all the electricity or not uh, nothing to do with the infrastructure itself if it's awarded um, the funds we would certainly do a second one um, and we also might as the second one increase it to a hundred and fifty kW system which is capable of charging a car uh, anywhere between 20 to 40 minutes um, that's what we would like to do at, at, at that site and it'd be just one station where one plug there's a it, uh, it, it, drawing of the yeah, although it isn't necessarily a great clear drawing Did we show a, a drawing? yeah it's, it's back in the packet information way back there page 59 oh I don't okay yes um, that's right so on this site um, actually we would so we we can actually this is great because we can actually build the the parking spots um, and in so doing we we can allow for a truck to come in that's hauling something as opposed to just pulling into a spot right um, so a truck that's hauling something can't just pull into a spot right it needs to be a pull through like a normal gas um, like a gas station um, so we would build this so that we'd have the drive-through capability so Ford F-150 it's hauling something um, they'd be able to pull in and then we'd also have spots for um, a commuter car and each dispenser has two uh, two dispensers okay um, so if we had two it'd be uh, enough for four cars at any one time and do you have any estimate on how many cars are out there electric cars are out there right now um, okay so in Oklahoma I think there are about 2,500 that's it um, in the entire state of Oklahoma 
Um, there's a lot of public policy around this in terms of incentivizing electric vehicles, not chargers, but the electric vehicles. Um, so federally, there's a $7,500 federal tax credit to buy EVs, but it's, um, it, it's, it's subject to each manufacturer. So each manufacturer gets 200,000 cars that would be subject that would get that tax credit and then it goes away. So Tesla as an example have pretty much hit that cap. Um, and, uh, but other manufacturers haven't. Um, in terms of state incentives, there are bills, uh, I think one bill that's going through the state legislature at the moment uh, that would give a, I think it's a thousand dollar credit for, um, for vehicles if you buy a, an EV in, in Oklahoma. Um, but then they're also talking about um, putting a $100 uh, road tax um, you know, on, on electric vehicle drivers, either one time or per year. But to us, electric vehicles, um, you know, if you've never driven one, highly encourage it. Um, what's great about electric vehicles are uh, basically three things. One is there's no maintenance. I mean, literally no maintenance. Um, and um, Number two, uh, they don't cost anything to, to fill up, right? It, if it costs $50 to fill up a sedan, uh, it might cost you at home, if you're charging, three to $4. If you're in public, it might cost you 10 to 15 bucks to fill up. So it's cheaper to operate, um, plus they just drive faster, right? There's no combustion. It's instantaneous power. Um, they're just wonderful cars. Um, and we're taking a view, you know, that, that they're going to they're going to come to Oklahoma. Uh, this facility in Muskogee, are you designing it so that you can ex expand it if need be in 15 years? Um, you, we, yes, we would. Um, yeah. We, and we then would have enough space. Let's put it that way. We yeah. have enough space where we could add in more. Uh, and this is just another curiosity question. And naturally, uh, chargers that can charge in 15 or 20 minutes seem awfully appealing. Uh, so if I come up and, and hook up to one of your charges, do, do, do I pay a small fee? So if you, I'm sorry. If I were to pull up to one of your charging stations, uh, I would pay a small fee? Yes. yes. What, what would that fee typically be? Um, it depends on the size. It depends on how fast the charger is. So let's use the 50 kW. I want to use the real fast charger. You want to use the real Big Daddy? Yeah. So the real Big Daddy is a 350 kW system. Mm -hmm. um, that um, is about $40 an hour. However, you're only plugged into it for about 15 to 20 minutes. Right. Okay. And, and you know, those systems are really meant for the driver that's driving cross country mm -hmm. doesn't want to stop more than 10 minutes or 15 minutes and he's probably going to pay a premium right that's not something that you generally or probably need or want downtown um but on the highway corridor i can see that corridor, mm -hmm. you're absolutely you're leaving so dallas and trying to get to kansas city and uh great, great. well 15 dollars is better than 65. <coughs> Wonderful. Yes, it is. Thank yeah. you. Mr. Mayor, may we be recognized? You certainly can. Yes, I was in California uh, this, in November yeah. and had a Tesla. It's nice. Yeah. Those cars are nice. But tell us the price of them. Um, okay, so there's different, um, you know, there's different levels of Teslas. Uh -huh. um, so the Roadster that came out five years ago, four years ago, it's about $125,000 car. Um, the Model S um, is about a $35,000 car. Um, so Tesla is, is um, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna see some major competition in, in the market uh, starting in 2019. Um, they've cornered the market on that lower priced electric sedan. $35,000 um, is um, uh, really where they, they have the biggest market share at the moment. But if you look at every car manufacturer in, in, in the world, including a lot of Chinese manufacturers that are going to be coming into the US, uh, we're gonna see cars of brand cars that we've never heard of, um, but they're all coming. Um, 
And uh, they will be at price points that are $35,000 or less. You know, the Nissan Leaf, as an example, um, is probably the lowest priced one. Um, and I, th I think that's at about 22,000, 23,000. So, so there are gonna be all different levels of um, price points for um, electric vehicles. Really, the, the biggest cost of all of this is in the battery. So you could buy a Porsche um, that, uh, that just came out. Uh, it's got a massive battery in it. It probably costs about $100,000. But that could go to the 350 kW charger and charge in about 10 minutes. You know of any here in, Oklahoma, in Muskogee? Excuse me? You know of any dealerships here in Muskogee that uh, has these cars uh, right now? Not yet. And it's really just going to be driven by consumer demand. So once consumers go to the dealerships and say, hey, I want an electric vehicle, they will start supplying them. But um, they're not, I mean, some are, for sure. But it, it's not ubiquitous right. yet, for sure. But it's heading that direction. Let's hope so. It is. What do you anticipate in five years from now? What percent of the automobiles traveling up and down 69 highway are going to be electric vehicles? So, um, so Bloomberg and NREL, they've all come out and they've kind of coalesced around this figure. So by 2030, 50% of all vehicles sold in America will be electric. That's only 12 years from now. Um, we have effectively modeled um, a 1% utilization rate starting in year one that frankly means 12 hours out of the entire month someone will be charging um, but we see that increasing let's call it 30 percent per year so once you get out to five six seven years you're looking at 10 to 15 percent utilization rates for these chargers um, and that's when they start you know becoming economic quite frankly um, if you look at california and the the high-speed chargers um, Again, this is such a new market. I mean, it truly is um, that the data out there is, is not great. Tesla really keeps their data to themselves. Um, but from what we can tell, you're, you're looking at a 20 to 25% utilization rate in California for these um, vehicles, uh, charging systems. So let's hope in five, 10 years, we have that kind of rate of adoption. Um, but there's not a whole lot yet, quite, quite clearly. You still have the paperwork I gave you, Mr. Miller, when I came from California, because mm -hmm. I, because I, I uh, got some stuff from Tesla when yeah. I was out there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, another question I want to give clarification. Sure. Exactly on whereabouts on Highway 69 is this going? It's, uh, Mr. Van, it's going right at the same place the new uh, tornado siren's going. That same piece of property that the city owns, out there uh, uh, near Quick Trip. But the tower, I mean, the the, the line at Tahlequah mm -hmm. Street, where you turn yeah. into. To the hotel, or you'd uh, look yes. you'd turn into right there by uh, Quick Trip. Trip. It would be on that side of the highway, per the illustration. But the tornado sign would still be there. Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. It's I'll going. Just... It, it, I think it went in today. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because it's it's fenced in. Yes. Okay. Well, I, like I say, I, I enjoyed looking at that car and, and being sitting in that car out there in California. It was nice. And they are nice. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, did you play with the emissions? <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yep. All right. Do so, I hear a motion regarding this item? Move for approval. Second. Yes, sir, Mr. Miller. Well, I know we're, I know we're ready to go. I just want to thank uh, the crew, the staff that worked on it because this was something we haven't done before. And so uh, Kelly and Prague and Drew and Chris, I really want to thank for learning something new quickly to get us to this point. It gives us a chance to be at the front end of new infrastructure, and that's where Muskogee wants to be. We're a community that's on the front end of things that are growing and, and expanding, and this gives us that opportunity at no cost to us. So I'm very excited about that possibility. Thank you guys for letting me sum that up, but I think it's very important. I'm assuming everybody is aware this will be our second charging location in Muskogee. Yes, we do. The first one being at uh, Davis Field Regional Airport, and there's two Tesla charging right. locations there. So. That's right. We're cornering the market. That's right. So, right? Absolutely <laughs> are. All right. We have a motion in a second. Is there other comments or discussion? Roll call. Deputy Mayor Jenny Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Motion carries. Item number 21. Consider accepting low bid of $492,798 from Chief Fire and Safety for the purchase of one 1500 GPM E1 custom pumper fire truck 
or take other necessary action. Uh, Chief O'Dell. Yeah, Mayor, members of the council, this bid is for the purchase of a new fire truck from the funds from the 2018 Assistance to Firefighters grant that we received. Uh, the bid is from Chief Fire and Safety out of Chickasha, Oklahoma, in the amount of $492,798. Uh, we advertised for bids. Uh, we sent out direct invitations via email to vendors, and Chief was the loan bid that we received. Uh, recommend approval, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Move for approval. Second. Get a motion and a second. No comments or questions? So thankful for this grant. Yes, <laughs> very much so. Roll call. Deputy Mayor Janie Boydston? Yes. Patrick Kale? Yes. Wayne Johnson? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Derek Reed? Yes. Dan Hall? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Mayor Coburn? Yes, motion carries. And we had no one else sign up to speak, is that correct? That's that concludes our agenda. Thank you for joining us for today's meeting.